you know, one thing I get a kick about with Maine versus Cape Cod is, you know, Hopper used to go to Maine when he was younger, but when he got older, he found it just too cold and became a Cape Cod person. Okay. It's, it's just fundamentally warmer down there. Yeah. And he, he used to like to go swimming alone. And I doubt that he uh, swam a whole lot in just up a little, just a little bit farther north uh, on the main coast. So, right. Apparently his wife, Joe, used to worry that he was going to drown, but he did not. He did. <laughs> yeah. Now he, he was a vigorous guy. I mean, he lived long, very long. So. And the residency you did was in Toro or New York City? Oh, Toro. Toro, okay. Yeah. It's it's not a formal residency. It's just, uh, I didn't know what else to call it. Yeah, it sounds like it's a private residency. Yeah, right? it's, it's <laughs> this family's beach house, but they yeah. rarely there, so, or often not there. So they've been very, very generous to my wife and I. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Oh, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy than me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think the big thing I learned about bold color was when I was in high school and did my first oil painting. Yeah. And it was very bold <laughs> and not something you'd want to look at. <laughs> so, <laughs> Would you say garish? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's polite. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they, they have, so, it, it's so pretty coming out of the tube. You get. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. You can sort of fall into a trance with it. Uh-huh. It's kind of like, what didn't they used to have this toothpaste that had like three different colors in it? Maybe they yeah. still- Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I forget the name of it. Imagine if yes. you had, imagine if you had, we had paint tubes like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somewhere online we could get this. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah. There's, a, there's a place uh, not far from where I'm painting now, um, it's called Garish Island. So <laughs> Perfect. We're, we look forward to seeing the paintings. <laughs> yeah. You know, if it turns out really bad, Lee, you'll have the title all set for That's it. That's right. That's so. right. So, so the next the next show with the three of us, we could call it Garish Color. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's nothing garish about any of these paintings, I must say. <laughs> You know, it, it's funny, I was so horrified by my first painting that I, I stopped painting for a few years. Wow. And then when I started again, um, I, I worked in acrylics because uh, that's what everyone in my school did. And um, I found just over the years, my paint got very, very subtle. By the time I got to grad school uh, in uh, for my MFA, I was painting like gray against brown was oh. the, the palette. <laughs> and then, you, you you know, but that was actually a very good place to study uh, yeah. values. Yeah. And then I got more colorful again as the years go by. Right. So, so I guess I'm headed towards garish. It's just a matter of time. It's just a natural cycle that you're, yeah. that you're going through. So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I, th I think we're ready to start. We're about four minutes into five o'clock, and I, I know people want to stick to a schedule. So um, um, I'm ready to start. You guys are ready? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. My name is Karen Wilkes, and I'm the director of Courthouse Gallery. And I'd also like to thank Philip Fry, Rick Fox, and Philip Koch. Uh, Try saying that three times really fast and you'll have a really, there'll be a challenge for offering to talk with us this evening about their use of color. We have, uh, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody that this, this Zoom talk is in coordination with their upcoming show that opens on June 12th, which is Monday. The title of the show is Bold Color. And we will be having an artist reception on June 21st, if you're around. All that information is right on our homepage, um, if you'd like to check that out. But I also hope if you're in the neighborhood, you get a chance to come see the show in, in person. It's quite a lot different than looking at it online or, you know, the 
slides that we have prepared for you in this show. Um, just to get started, I'm not going to say a lot about each of these three artists. We have uh, some very nice bios on their artist page on our website. They're all career artists. They've been doing this for a very, very long time. And uh, the things that are in common, that they have in common that brings them together in this, with this show is their use of color. And, and color is something I believe we could, we could certainly all use a lot more right now here in Maine. We've had a pretty miserable cold and wet mm -hmm. stretch here lately. And if you've been in Maine all winter, like many of us have, um, spring is very stingy and <laughs> color comes to us in the natural world in little bits and pieces. The Prasithia didn't even last that long when they yeah. came out. And, and I've got to say, I haven't even really noticed the lupin. I don't know if it's because we've had so much dry weather and people are complaining about not being able to plant and we're desperate for color up here. <laughs> Luckily, we have these three artists tonight who are who are really all about bringing color into our lives all year round. And one of the things that is so important about color is it's transformative. And colors have personalities, they affect our moods and our emotional responses. And to be able to surround yourself with colorful paintings in your home or your office is truly a wonderful way to live, um, especially if you have a very long winter like we do. So all three of these artists have built their careers around the use of color. Tonight, um, just in case you're not familiar with them, I just wanna remind you, we have Philip Fry joining us from Sullivan and Rick Fox, who is new to the gallery. I'd like to welcome Rick um, to our stable of artists. He lives down in Kittery, Maine. And Philip Koch, who's been connected with Maine and painting her landscape for many, many years, but he lives in Maryland. Um, so we're going to start with Phil Fry. And just to keep it straight, we're going to call Phil Phil, Phil Fry, and Philip Koch, Philip Koch, I mean, Philip. Um, so, Phil, I, just to get started here, I'd like to ask you what drew you to strong colors originally? And are there any artists whose palette you emulated when you first began to paint? Mm, yeah. Um, gosh, what drew me to strong color in the first place? I, that's a good question. I, it's, I think it's a hard one to answer. I think it's mainly just the looking at the natural, natural world as you were sort of mentioning earlier and um, growing up outside and uh, being in, in nature a lot. And that, that was sort of, I think, sort of the, 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 can the eye candy, so to speak, um, seeing things in nature and then discovering art, world, art um, you know, paintings and so forth when I was in school. Um, and what was the second, second question? Who are the artists whose palette you oh, admired, yeah. emulated when you first started to paint? Yeah, uh, when I think back, um, uh, Vasily Kandinsky was was one of them, um, and uh, Matisse, uh, Henri Matisse, and uh, Cezanne were sort of the early early ones. But I think Matisse has sort of been the one that I've really focused on over the years, on and off. Um, and some of the other fauvists um, that were, you know, painting around his time. And to me, uh, Matisse has this, uh, there's something about the boldness of, of his work that has always struck me. Um, it is actually, there's a quote that I, I've read um, before. I would just want to read it right quick because you, he says, to look at something as though we have never seen it before takes great courage. And, um, and I think that's what he's done with color and so forth. And that's what I'm, what I'm trying to do with color a little bit is something unexpected, um, something that's interesting, interesting to me. And um, like say in particular, this painting here, you know, Vanishing Point um, is looking at a place 
you know, that's part of one of what I'm interested in is, is place. But then taking what I see and uh, inserting uh, some unexpected color there, taking what's there and, and um, intensifying it or dulling it down and um, pulling it all together to, to make a piece that's, that's exciting to me. And from there, in terms of sort of the process, it's, um, I often work from sketches and uh, in the summertime or the, the warmer weather, I kind of take, you know, I go outside and paint uh, like, like Rick and Philip do. And um, so that's, that's part of, part of the answer to those, those questions. Well, you know what I like about this painting? Um, well, first of all, whatever those trays are, that that brilliant blue of, mm. I don't know if they're bait boxes or whatever they're. Yeah, called. they're bait boxes, I, yep. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Thanks. And, and all the little splashes of color as you go back into the depth of that painting, the, you know, it's hard to know what the items are, but I guess it doesn't even really matter. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's it, part of yeah, it's that's part of it is that I, I added some things in there. And um, one of the thing that's one of the things that draws me to sort of the working waterfront of, of Maine is the all the stuff that goes, <laughs> that goes around, um, you know, lobster fishing, you know, you have the traps, you have the, the, the on the right, that sort of turquoisey color, that's just piles of rope. And yeah. um, and oftentimes the stuff is somewhat organized, you know, the traps and the boxes. And there's just, to me, it, it, the, it's like, it's the palette of the fishermen. You know, there's all these different colors there that are just really intriguing to me. You know what, it kind of goes back for me, Phil, just thinking about what I said about being in Maine. If you ever go someplace like Jonesport. Yeah. And it's a long winter here, I gotta say, and it's pretty dreary. And spring is the dreariest part of the whole thing. Winter can be beautiful in its own right, but their yep. colors are all like brilliant. Their houses are all painted like outrageous colors. Yeah. You know, like people introduce color into their structures in the winter, just, I guess, to make them, you know, feel better. Um, so you're yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, it's like this, that little shack there, it's like, why, why did that, um, whoever painted it, why did they just put the yellow at the top and the white on the bottom? And it was just, so, but it's cool. I liked it. It's like, <laughs> I've, got, I've got to paint this. <laughs> so tell us about this one. It's called Fisherman's Delight. Yeah, again, it's, it's a bit of the same thing. You know, this was down in uh, Portland Waterfront which I've done a, a whole bunch of paintings of. And it's, it, you know, wandering around there is just a, a visual delight for, for me. And I think probably for any painter, you know, going down there and looking at, at all of this. And part of it is what I was trying to do is uh, compose a piece that, um, that I could break up the the picture plane in in kind of unex, unexpected ways and use some of those verticals and diagonals and those pops of color of the of the traps and the rope and the and the buckets and um, and then also kind of this the sense of light as well you know early in the morning uh, where the light is just coming up and that's that's when. Yeah. To me, the light is the most intense yeah. um, versus the middle of the day where everything gets washed out when the sun is directly overhead. And it's those the long shadows of the morning or the evening. And it's it's when the color is to me is really exciting. Um Philip and Rick, you can jump anytime, but jump in yeah. anytime with comments and stuff. But I just want to say one thing that I want to point out for people to start looking at and for you guys to uh, start talking about is is um, the brushwork and the differences between these three artists and how they handle the brushwork as well as the brushwork and making the shapes. You know, you'll notice in Phil's here, there's a lot of um, blocky shapes. 
And so it'd be interesting to hear about, you know, what you're doing with that mm. aspect of of color. I mean, they're both integrated into <clears throat> making the scene come together. Mm -hmm. um, but you've been doing this a, a while now, Bill, and it seems yeah. to be very successful in your paintings. And it's and you can really see it in this one and painting in mm -hmm. particular. Um, and and, and yeah. that goes back to you know the nice thing about the waterfronts is all those great structures are inherent in the in the scene. Yeah, yeah. I think part of it is is what um, I think when we were preparing for this talk that Rick had mentioned uh, about sort of his influence uh, with uh, of Cezanne, and you know I think Cezanne probably looms large in many many a painter's life in in one way or another, but sort of looking at sort of the the facets and um, okay. in terms of turning a form and uh, giving it a sense of uh, three dimensions and so forth. And for me, it's, it's interesting to like, say for example, the, the boat there, the hull of the boat, I really worked quite a bit in terms of trying to break up that space. And um, rather than it just being this, um, so, you know, two or three values and, and colors and breaking it up in unusual patterns and also repeating some of those shapes, those triangular shapes that would repeat elsewhere in, in the painting. So this is Paul uh, on the Franklin Barons. Yeah, this, um, I partly grew up in Franklin and um, walked around the Franklin Barons quite a bit. And I've done a number of number of paintings of them over the years. And if some of you know, you know, in the in the springtime, the or well in the fall, you get the these uh, this red gorgeous color um, that can happen, uh, which is with a counterpoint to some of the greens that might happen. And um, and then sometimes they get burnt in the fall. So you have these stretches of sort of this charcoal against this red and green. Um, so that's part of what I was interested in here, but also trying to do something different on the lower half of the painting where kind of uh, playing with the foreground a bit, you know, not trying to flesh out things too much, but just more suggest suggest the foreground. You, you know, it's interesting, I think, both in Phil's and Rick's work and my own, uh, in addition to the color, uh, you know, the big brush work, mm -hmm. uh, the very noticeable brush work is a real hallmark. Uh, that's it really, in, it's a little bit independent of the forms uh, that are actually being painted. And it's, it's very characteristic of what gives each of the painters work the personality that it does. You know, there's a real unmistakable quality to Phil's big blocky brushwork. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a very good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I think how you said that is, is, is good, Philip. You know, sort of the, the, the brushstroke works sort of independently of the form sometimes. And I, sometimes it's, it's interesting to how to, I'd like to push that em envelope sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes it gets a little kitschy, other times it works. Um, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there's, a <laughs> there's a discovery process there. It's like, oh, yeah, that, that really yeah. didn't work. Or, oh yeah, that works. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, Phil, and that, that foreground also uh, reminds me of, I'm interested in um, what Bouillard has to say um, about like the, the movement of the Nabi N-A-B-I-S, um, which means the prophet. I know you know, I'm just saying, telling everyone else. Um, so this group of painters, um, one of the things that they were interested in is, is trying to explore like what visual perception, like the real, like true human experience of visual perception and their experience of the, the um, around the, perif the peripheral vision gets kind of blurry. And so the paintings would often have that like dissipated quality around the edges mm. and and just the way you treated that especially the the bottom you know yeah. reminds me of that you know yeah 
Yeah, it's it's one of the things that I've sort of thought about or I've been thinking about and like John Singer Sargent did a little bit of that in terms of the way he would focus on sort of the the faces there'd be such you know strong detail and focus on on either the face and the hands and then fabric and so forth would be more more painterly so to speak and um mm -hmm. and then also some of the painters that are uh, our contemporaries that are what they call um interrupted realist or fractured realists you know um where they're kind of interrupting a very uh, uh what do you call it um representational piece and it, it, it brings in a sense of movement to it and that's mm -hmm. part of what i'm interested in it's so it's a little less static mm -hmm. I, I like what you said about that rick it, and you know it, it does kind of make the painting otherwise it would just be a you know a blueberry baron um but mm -hmm. it is interesting how you treated that foreground it makes it really much much more exciting and and, and um, intriguing yeah thank you and part of what i've been doing too and i think i was noticing this in uh, rick's work where i think you use a bit of um various palette knives and probably other other tools but we'll, we'll learn about it in, in a in a minute but for me it's i've been using these squeegees um you know various lengths to push paint around and take paint off and make marks that i couldn't otherwise get with with a brush and um and there's a sense of discovery with it it's a it's a to me it's a bit like the days, college days when I was doing printmaking, where you'd make up, you'd, you'd ink a plate, and then you put it through the press, you really didn't know what you were going to get on the other end, which was part of the fun, and of the discoveries, like, who knows what's going to happen here, especially in like mono prints. But here, it's, it's interesting to sort of, you know, how can I push and pull the paint around, and lift it and put it on and, um, and then just sort of leave it and not fuss with it too much. Yeah. I just have one other thing that I'm just like coming to mind. Um, I worked in grad school. I worked with um, George Nick and um, I'm still friends with him. And I remember once he said to, to me, you know, you got to, what's with the wispy cloud you have in your painting? You got to paint a cloud like it's made out of concrete. And I was like, what the <laughs> hell does that mean? And um, and your cloud is like, it's so sculptural and has so much air around it. And that's one of the things. It's it's like, you can really feel like that has form to it, you know? Like you could take a mold of it, right? Yeah, right, right, you know. right. Yeah. yeah, you could use a 3D printer on it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you'd see him. Go for it, Karen. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I want to mention too, like all three of you, your your painting is based in landscape, but it's not, you know, photorealistic or anything because of the way you're using your marks and and what you said, Rick, about you know the wispy clouds and all that, the the mark making and the shapes that you you use if you blow up a corner of these they're very abstract this is the this is the interior of my house um i have a very small like 600 square foot house um and uh i i've done a, a small series of of paintings of of my of the interior of the house and and other interiors over the years and one of the things i love about doing interiors is that you get a whole new palette of, of colors yeah. to choose from. And it really kind of liberates me from sort of, you, you know, oftentimes we feel kind of, uh, what's the word, uh, legally bound to, to when we're doing landscapes to blues, greens, and, and, and uh, otherwise, and browns for whatever. Um, and so the interior just sort of just opens things up tremendously. And also composition wise, there's lots and lots that can be done. And yeah. so to me, this is just really exciting just to kind of play with, with that stuff and push and pull uh, spatial stuff um, with an eye towards say Matisse and um, 
even like deep in corn with some of his his work you know is is looking pushing and pulling kind of the the edges of things and um yeah it's uh, <laughs> interesting phil there aren't any paintings hanging on the wall <laughs> <laughs> they're all sold <laughs> right they all sold they're yeah. they're there it's just sort of i i didn't put any kind of uh um like that that brown area off to the right above the couch and the pillow that's actually a, a painting and right there yeah, right uh, but i didn't flesh it out it sort of it wasn't anything that i wanted quite to beautiful right extract. here the, the color oh thank you right in the fireplace okay. there yeah yeah it's like i had done the the painting early i had done it in a couple stages and then repainted it and i realized i didn't there wasn't a fire in in the uh, in the wood stove when I first painted it. It's like there's got to be a fire in the wood stove. It's like <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> it was like so it, it really kind of made made that section. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, it's there's I like to kind of create sort of vignettes or or areas of focus. Um, like that, and then say the couch, and then the the kitchen oh, table, and, the green. Yeah, yeah, and then you know this sort of sense of depth too. It, it's always been kind of a thing that's been interested interesting to me is like how how to create this sort of sense of depth even in a very shallow sort of depth of field that might be in a house. You know, it's only twenty some odd feet from where I'm standing to to the window on the other side. So how do you create that depth and and so forth? Mm. Well, oh, uh, Carl, Carl mentions, uh, he said that reminds him of uh, Fairfield Porter, Carl Little. Oh. Not just chimed in, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's de Carl, that's definitely one of my um, influences. Yeah. In Fairfield Porter, and I'm sure with you guys too. Yes. So we're going to switch now to Rick Fox. And these are two of his paintings. They're, they're small. They're only 12 by 9. But they're loaded with um, interest, flux and rascal. And I'm going to turn this over to you, Rick. And, and you might even start by telling us you know, how, how you got interested in, in this kind of a color palette, which is very strong. Uh, I think the thing that's the unifying thing here between the three of you. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, so I think I mean, Bill just mentioned Fairfield Porter. So, um, when I was like twelve or thirteen, my dad took me by myself without my other. Um, I have I have three brothers just by myself to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and there was a Fairfield Porter retrospective, um, and that I just still remember that it blew me away. The big, especially his bigger paintings, I could not believe someone could paint color like that, um, and just being able to get up close to the big paintings and just be lost in these these abstractions, and then move back and and realistic at the same time so that really had a big effect on me um and it was also extra special because i was you know spent mm -hmm. that time with my dad um exclusively you know mm -hmm. so um yeah and then um yeah a lot of i mean i love so many painters um but in you know in undergrad um you mean de kooning was a big big influence um um, who else? Yeah, if, as I mentioned um, before, if Weard is a is an influence too, and Bonard. Um, but this, um, these two paintings were um, done in late fall of of two thousand twenty two. So this past fall, um, and I had I had uh, stepped away from teaching full-time um, at University of New Hampshire, teaching painting and drawing full-time last spring. So this was the fall after that. Um, and there was just, there was such a freedom um, in, in stepping away from teaching and, and 
part of it was because I didn't have the aspirations or expectation to kind of be an expert anymore and <laughs> which I could easily get caught in this trap of like having dispensing tools um, which the students could sometimes misread as kind of absolutes and I could uh, convince myself they were absolutes too you know so without having that um, I you know I didn't have to articulate anything I didn't I could just reconnect with painting and there was it was you know it sounds strange to say but there was like an amorality it became amoral because it also I was so excited excited again by painting and just being out in nature and having this experience juggling all these tools which we all juggle when we're painting outside especially um that the the activity again was so rich and intense that there was there was absolutely the the idea that it, it was a socially or um morally redeeming activity at all is like completely gone and uh, you know, I was allowed to, um, had the freedom to, um, you know, simplify more, it seems, and experiment with, um, you know, more, more, yeah, bold color, I guess, and um, just more experimenting and, and much more, it also felt like there was much more feeling um, I was as a, able to access out there. So, and what, but I sometimes think about thinking about it now. It it was like um, suddenly I was like that expression drinking um, drinking from a fire hose, and that I just was so felt so privileged to have this this discipline of painting, which using that in painting um, is like having a um, adjustable valve on that fire hose <laughs> to make it a little bit manageable, but still like like very exciting and um and satisfying so and, and and these two are of the um you know the same place and i don't go out with the intention of making a series um but often i start in a place and it just kind of leads to it kind of unearths something else and i want to get back and work on that painting or like start a new one with that thread and it just kind of continues until it kind of gets exhausted, you know, and then I'll move somewhere else. Carl, uh, Rick, Carl was asking, um, where does the title Rascal come from? Um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting because um, I think it's it's I think it's related to that spirit of not having to be a teacher anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like, yeah, I don't know. They're, they're, it just feels kind of like something to it is, is um, I don't know, rascally. I don't know what. <laughs> you know. Some freedom there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm curious, Rick, where, um, can I, if I might ask a question. Um, what is, when you're approaching your, your color palette, you know, are you going in with with an idea or are you just letting the the experience of the of the place um sort of dictate that or your how 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 do you think about that and how do you approach it yeah that's that's interesting because the um so this past year i've um i've been doing um simultaneously in my studio um a, a big series of heads and so I started this head series because, um, you know, a couple of years ago, the, the tools I was using, the way I was looking at landscape was no longer working. It wasn't like something was happening and I needed to like figure out how to reorganize and do something. So I, I had the idea of go into my studio with like, which I could have more controlled lighting and spend longer periods of time with that controlled lighting and just to simplify and have one form in like a basic space. And so I just thought of, I know I'll just do my head, you know? So it was a very, like I was using a mirror, but it was very loose of, it, it wasn't necessarily a portrait, um, but it was just like a head in space, you know? And that 
I've been doing that simultaneously with the landscapes and um, both I've been trying to not have an idea um, going in and just try to like spontaneously respond and, and kind of see what happens and try to follow that thread, you know. You know, Rick, what you said about the way you had been working in landscape, not continuing to be a, helpful to you and then needing to try something else. And so you did this, started this head series. Well, I can so relate to that. Uh, I think very few artists really consciously choose their direction. Mm -hmm. uh, they just find that they, what used to work well becomes uncomfortable and that they have to move to something new. Uh, right. it, it's almost like shoes wearing out. I mean, they, they start out fitting so well and then they, they get stretched out and you need to get some new shoes sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> that's totally. sort of uh, my theory of art history. Yeah, Ex exactly, exactly. Yeah, Philip, that's yeah, exactly right. And I, I was this past week. I was for some reason I was thinking. Um, I was just thinking back back to uh, teaching and you know, especially working with undergraduates, and I especially love teaching intro painting to undergraduates um, and how excited they. You know the students can get when they start to see the different like not see gray shadows anymore but see the color in the shadows and then that takes them off into seeing color in everything and it gets it's so exciting and it still is for me um but it also felt very rewarding being able to you know give them these tools and rules so that those big feelings at that age which are irrepressible and so exciting to be around that the, you know, trying to bring facility or technical ability up to match those feelings so they can do something that matches, right? right. Um, and then what happens, you know, what happened for me is like, I like had some facility and I want to work on that and work on that and work on that. And then eventually it gets to a point because all of us grow and our feelings are not necessarily the same big feelings. They're sometimes more complex and subtle and everything else. And those, that facility sometimes can be, you know, can work against that or not meet those. So what I have found is as I paint more, like I have to find ways to like trick myself out of, um, some kind of technical ability or any kind of right. skills, right? So, and I think all artists go have that. And that's exactly what Philip was just talking about. It's it's getting that new pair of shoes and that can fit yep. the kind of the vibration or frequency of that feeling, you know? Yep, that's a great way of saying it. Before we move on to the next uh, slide, Rick, um, even, even if it felt weighted, this section in here is just gorgeous. This whole thing oh. in here, this water. Oh, and thanks. Colors are amazing. I mean, they're they're really quite striking. Um, I just wanted to share that. So your next painting, which is very different from the first two here, called Conversations, is very abstract, but I mean, it's still still a landscape. Um, this I've been painting most of the day at this spot and um, you know, the cloud, it was pretty cloudy. That's why on cloudy days, I often love cloudy days to paint as so many painters do because you can stay yeah. and paint for longer periods of time um, without the sun moving so much. But towards, you know, late afternoon, suddenly the sky started to open up yeah. and um it was just very, very exciting for me. And and then also in order to do that, you know, to try to get, for me to try to get that, what those thrills that I was experiencing, um, you know, I'm trying to pare down and get to the points in as simple a way as I can and trying to figure out how to organize those more simplified color shapes to get a parallel experience of, you know, what's happening in front of me. Um, so, you know, I'm definitely not thinking of, I'm going to do an abstract painting now. It's still like, I just want to paint 
this experience of what you know what's happening so do you primarily um, um do you primarily work um on location when you're doing landscape yeah yeah and i'll have like what i'll bring um lately i've been bringing like three or four paintings out with me and you know at least one blank canvas too um so as i go with the lights changing you know i can bring out a different painting um you know often i'll have like be in the same spot and i've started a cloudy day painting uh one day and then a sunny day painting and the the weather changes so much here anyway that i'll bring both out and i'll be able to switch back and forth um this is uh another sample i'm just kind of watching the time here guys so sure it's called sweep and and it is more representational but um still has all those great elements um, i'm just curious about this one spot right here <laughs> yeah that's um a color that wasn't mixed properly <laughs> 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 no i mean like that yeah that's i'm crazy. trying i'm trying to mix the value and and kind of like the color feeling and often what will will happen is like I don't I feel like I the thing's moving and the lights changing and I have to just decide you know to use it and often it's not mixed thoroughly and you get a, a get a surprise of those those lines of other color that orange that was mixed in that didn't mix oh you know? yeah yeah it's oh, kind Lord. of like um it's like mix it's like um eating a muffin when it hasn't been mixed thoroughly and all of a sudden you get like <laughs> the powder well, well, right. <laughs> I, I think it's better than that. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Philip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, it kind of reminds me a bit of, um, I, I don't know if you know Howard Hodgkin's paintings. Yeah, thank you. I love Howard Hodgkin's. Oh yeah. my gosh, his work is just astounding. Yeah, it's beautiful. There's some of that that quality in your work, of, of his work, where there's just this discovery while, while painting feeling. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, yeah, that is. I mean, like that the discovery and the surprises are are yeah. like so great, and that's those are Just some of the reasons I'm painting. Last slide, Rick. The, these two are different than the ones we've been seeing. I mean, there's quite a lot of variety here, but this is a beautiful um, palette, none the same. Maybe later in the day. Yeah, I think. Yeah, they're definitely late, both later in the day. That's true. That's true, Karen. But I'm thinking, I'm um, just thinking of that um, the Cezanne quote um, where he said that um, you know, he knew Monet and he used to visit Monet's house just reading biographies. That, but he has this quote saying like Monet was just an eye, but my God, what an eye! Um, so this is Cezanne saying it about Monet, and I, I mean, I can understand like in terms of Cezanne's paintings and Monet's paintings, why he would say that. But it's a little misleading because Monet, is, Monet like the human eye, is not separate from who we are yeah. and all of our complex feelings, emotions, like intellectual, it, you cannot separate it. So, um, so that's what, like, th this idea of, of feeling is... You know, I don't like every every time I go out into the landscape, the landscape is different. And, you know, maybe I had a good lunch or I didn't have a good lunch or like I didn't sleep or I did sleep or whatever it is that I'm feeling different. And so it's I've always feel like I'm playing that game I used to play when I was a kid with my brothers of like someone would hide something and then you're like someone that is who hit it will say to the people looking, you know, you're warmer or cooler, warmer, cooler, getting closer to it. So like the application of the paint um, and the colors I'm using, the palette I'm choosing as I'm working with, as I'm doing it is, is either warmer or cooling to, cooler to the, to kind of calibrating with the, with both my, my state and the landscape, how I'm experiencing the landscape. Um, and of course, the time of the day has a big part of that, you know. So yeah, there's and it's it's very. I mean, looking at these, it's interesting, um, you know, how I'm dividing up 
the, the canvas in a similar way. And I have the little like surprise of the, the moon, mm -hmm. you know, or that light. Yeah. In both. Yeah. Um, it's kind of both are a little bit curvy on top, you know? So, and I just think, is that a big, big, what's that? Probably didn't intend for these to be a pair, but they make a very nice pair. No. Yeah, they yeah. do. They do. It, uh, yeah. But I, because I'm doing, um, because I am doing a series of heads simultaneously, um, you know, I always feel like everything, most artists feel like everything is a self portrait and um, it's very revealing to what goes on the canvas. And so it's kind of, it's interesting to look at them like this, which like different pairings, like to see, like, okay, what, like, what's going on? Why am I dividing the canvas like that? And why do I put that that little moon in there or that light in there or peeking out or barely touching or whatever? They're gorgeous. Well, thanks, thank you. Rick. We're gonna, You're welcome. We're, we're gonna move on to Philip. And uh, this is the first painting called Canopy. So okay. we should ask you too, the same Phil, what brought you to your palette, which is, is very different. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, one thing I've really enjoyed this afternoon is seeing you know two other painters who do very fine things with color that's so different than how I use it. Um, it's 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 just amazing how people individuate without meaning to. Uh, uh, the color in this painting, um, I, I, I think the number one thing I was trying to do is make something that was very, very complicated, the space of these dozens of vertical trees, uh, trunks, make some sense. Uh, and I got, I got the feeling I needed to do something that was not vertical and not blue purple. And so I put this big sweep of uh, yellow ochre colors moving across the, the canvas uh, in, in a direction that's not vertical. Uh, and I wanted to underline that. I, I don't think anyone would admit, anyone would miss it, but it's it's sort of has an exclamation point put on it, just because it's so far coloristically away from the color of the background and the sky. Um, you know, color in a lot of ways is a way to just turn a spotlight for the viewer onto the thing that you you want to show them. Uh, you know, no painting can be about everything, even though it will have a lot of elements. Some of them have to be more important than others. And I think using bright color and high contrast in some places, and then very low intensity color and low contrast in other places, it's a wonderful way to, for the artist to say to the viewer, hey, you know, look over here, here's the cool thing. Uh, and that's that's what I, how I try to think about it. I had a wonderful teacher. I, actually, I've had a lot of wonderful teachers. I'm uh, very fortunate. But this guy um, in grad school, Robert Barnes, used to say, I was actually painting imaginary planets at the time, if you can believe this. And he said, you know, you got this very interesting story, but how you tell the story, you know, how you use the color and the brushstroke, that's just as important as what you're telling people. And that was a tremendous lesson to me that, uh, you know, a painting is so much about how it's done. And that certainly goes into the color choices one makes, especially if you want what you're saying to come across to the viewer. So uh, one other thing I want to say about color, I, I think good color, uh, it has to surprise the viewer. In fact, in some ways, I think, putting in a color that you know would you'd never see in nature but make it look like it might belong there um, it, it can be a wonderful way to engage the viewer um, you know i i don't know about you guys but i just find nature and actually living is just it's always surprising uh, sometimes it's it's really delightful sometimes it's very painful but i i think painting has to have that sense of surprise and unexpected uh, to bring it to life and certainly playing around with color and, and experimenting with color and, and trying to make colors work that probably shouldn't but let's see if you can get away with it anyway 
uh, is a very good way to approach color. Certainly these uh, other two artists, Rick and Phil, uh, play around, are very, very playful with few choices. Or they see funnies. You know, I find it interesting what you said, um, <laughs> Philip, about the, because, you know, obviously the, the power lines are doing the same thing as what yeah. you said the, the yellow ochre leaves were doing. But I do, now that you talk about it, I can see how that, that um, what you're trying to do is, is happening, you know, draw your attention across in that sweep of energy going across the canvas. So really kind of fascinating. By the way, I didn't draw the red marks over there on the screen. I don't know where they came from. Um, I don't know. I, I saw I saw some 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 iPad something or other popped up and drew it somehow. Well, uh, well, I don't know. I'm not a Zoom expert, and I don't know how it happened. But anyway, it wasn't me, folks. And uh, <laughs> do you guys have any comments before we move on to the next slide? Well, I like. I mean, your um, oh, Katie Nimkin just popped up on the screen. Maybe that was her. Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, wherever that is, um, I I like that the you were talking about sort of the contrast of the yellow and the blue, and that there's this uh, surprising quality to it, like you said, those those two colors against each other, and then that sort of another surprise of that red, um, you know, it's an under kind of an understated kind of crimson that's that's in there, um, which is quite a nice little little sort of visual treat that that happens within it thank you and I, I would just like to say that um just in just before we started the zoom today at the beginning you were I love you were you just mentioned or yeah you had mentioned how you started out um with that bold that bold painting and then you you went to kind of like Mm, more yeah. more of a brown or or I I I heard it as I mean this is not what you said I paraphrase it in my head of of like really buckling down with value yeah and and you had mentioned on when we met last week to prepare for this that you know the drawing and sometimes the value drawings are really important to you and when I'm looking at this I can really appreciate that that you I just feel like it's like a hard one and it's really difficult to to get the value structure of a space like this, especially when you're using simplified, yeah. uh, kind of loose, uh, kind of spontaneous shapes in the color. But that that intense sensitivity to the value to create that space is is I think is has the ability to hold that all the other good things in there. Right. And it's um and I've seen that I really appreciate that in the few paintings that I've seen of yours of that there's so much air in that in in there in that like dense woods there's still so much air in there there's a lot of space yeah, yeah. thank you you know what's funny to me is um I, I think color is the best thing in art uh, I also think color is the worst thing in art uh it is very hard to handle but it is when done well it's just delightful uh, I, I think in some ways, color is, you, you used the word rascal before, Rick. I, I like that. I think color is rascally. It likes to misbehave. And it's almost like trying to hold on to melted butter. It, it tends to slip away and get all over the place. And I think it needs to be cont to contained so that we can hold it down and enjoy it. And to me, the way to do that is through coming up with a good network of dark and light changes and a good network of silhouettes or shapes. Uh, mm. for, so for, for me, I, I think in some ways there has to be a, a, a black and white or a monochrome structure mm. of drawing uh, to, to hold the painting together. Mm -hmm. Compared to you guys, uh, I sort of feel like a little bit more of a 19th century artist because I, I think my paintings almost always have black in them, um, which is very characteristic of the 19th century. I am the oldest artist here, too, so maybe I'm just historically closer <laughs> to the 19th century. 
I, I do do a lot of drawing in black and white. I, I like to do drawings outside with fine charcoal. Yeah. And often the best of those will become uh, the springboard that will lead to oil paintings. Yep, yep, you can uh, tell. Philip, so we do have a little question from Stephanie Blossom. I'm assuming it's for you. And she's asking if you make studies and then move to the studio. To, yes. To, yes. Yeah. Yeah, almost always there's a small study done first, uh, sometimes outside, sometimes just out of my imagination. And sometimes um, every now and then I, I don't do a study, but uh, this this one had studies for it. It's a, you know, when you do a small piece, um, you can try anything. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. Uh, and no one has to see it. So that's really what studies are about. They're like a private experiment. And then they, when they work out, they can really help you uh, get a wind in your sails for a larger canvas that has you know, lots and lots of pieces to it. Mm. It's practice, you know, musicians practice. Yeah. So that's, I think that's one of the ways that artists practice. Mm. So your next slide here is called September Cove. And, yeah. you, you know what's funny uh, is that uh, I love a comment that Phil made earlier about he likes doing interiors because the colors that are presented by indoors are so different. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time in Maine and I grew up on a Maine-like environment on the shore of Lake Ontario, which is rocky and cold. It's not quite as dramatic as you guys in Maine. But it, there are places where you see white sand, and I sort of feel like this is like a great opportunity to get the color white into a painting. <laughs> there's very few white, except in the snow. Other than snow, there's very little white in the landscape, and yet it's such a beautiful color to play off against ochres and oranges and blues. Uh, so this was a white sand and a, a tidal estuary. And I just thought, oh, what a, what a great color idea this sand is giving me. So th this could be another example of uh, a painting where the color contrast, the hue contrasts are exaggerated, but it's sort of held together into this big triangle, long attenuated triangle of dark that is basically 50,000 or 50 shrubs uh, grown together and a just sort of mushing them together into this big, simple shape. I love the um, the the gorgeous that that purpley cloud just sort of echoing off in the diagonal. Um, you know, sort of echoing the the diagonal in the bottom bottom right. Uh, that's such such a gorgeous piece. Oh, thank you. You you know, it's funny. I don't know where. The clouds just are a place where you can completely play. I think mm. nobody knows what clouds look like. It's sort of like no one knows what water looks like. And it really allows you to be an abstract painter completely and still have those things fit into the painting. It's it's a really a playpen for composition. And um, that's one of the one of the things I think it's a real joy of landscape compared to portraiture. You know what else is interesting too, um, Philip, is the way you treat your trees. You know, in yeah. here, it, uh, you know, you have a like Rick and Phil. You have you know some distinctive shapes. Yeah. To your um, leaves and branches and shrubbery, distinctive to your painting. Um, yeah. And I'm not looking at it close up in person, so you know I really can't tell um, the brushwork that's that's yeah. going on right there. But um, well, it, it's interesting. I think like Rick and Phil, uh, the brushwork is very important. Um, I think I use a smaller brush than uh, Phil does, and I you know I don't know the size Rick of your pieces. So it's, it's hard for me to say, but certainly one thing the three of us have in common is we're very interested in addition to intense color, uh, the, the mark making is, mm. is a huge part of the painting. Yep. Uh, I, I, again, this same teacher I mentioned earlier from grad school, uh, you know, he, he had this wonderful phrase. He said, um, 
be interesting in the little things. And so I said, what, what does that mean? <laughs> I, I wanted this to be spelled out. And he says, you know, be surprising with the strokes. You know, don't let people know ahead of time how your hand is going to move any more than they should know ahead of time what color you're going to choose. Of, co of course, the thing, the surprise you come up with, it has to fit the, the form you're describing and the story you're telling, but it, it has to surprise the viewer. And that's something that I, I just think is, is so terribly important. And that's something I, I see in the work of these other two artists is there's this surprising, unexpected quality. And that's, that's something I like about their work. And it's something that I, I strive for. Uh, you know, besides, is there anybody here who knows what they're doing in life and where they're going and what <laughs> next week is going to be like? I, I, I mean, yes, and of course, no. And we do know that there's going to be some very colorful, wonderful things and some difficult things. And it's vivid. I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, life doesn't feel monochrome to mm. most people. And that's one of the reasons I think people are drawn to painting and to colorful paintings uh, in particular is they feel their own experience uh, in, the, in those works, so. Yeah, I agree with you, Philip. Um, yeah, I would just like, I just, I'm just looking at now that the, um, the, the white sand, the, the, like the light on that white sand is really, um, setting off and making me really appreciate both the value and the colors of the other higher key um, shapes and colors in the painting, especially like the, the breaking waves in the back on the left, and then the, the color of that really light sky above the horizon, and then the color of the sky above the clouds, which are all different values and colors. And, you know, they seem kind of light or whitish, but up against seeing the the sand beach with that light on it it's they're not right it's it's um really and again it just i mean it just i just admire your um your, your sensitivity to value to allow mm. you know that those colors to really Thank like you. yeah shine I, like I, that. i think you, you had mentioned rules for painters earlier rick and and of course rules are meant to be broken but they're a wonderful starting point. And I think one rule that I follow in most paintings is, you know, have a range of values of darks and lights, and then have a range of intensities of color. Mm -hmm. And, you know, have some, and that's certainly something I, that all three of us do. It's, it's one of the ways to add, you know, some of that extra surprise and vitality into the paintings. Mm -hmm. A real common mistake with beginners is the you know the all intense bold color everywhere mistake, mm -hmm. uh, and that that has never produced I think an interesting painting. Yeah. It's sort of like going to a very crowded bar and trying to have a conversation, and you just you you can't hear yourself think, much less what your partner is trying to say. So, yeah. But this is a quiet bar before the crowd comes. <laughs> <laughs> I love your analogies, Philip. And right. I, I was just at a very crowded bar and I, I couldn't understand what was being said to me. And I, I just, I don't know how people do that. I, I, I'm, I can't handle the dating scene, I guess. Oh, well. <laughs> Good thing you're married. <laughs> this next yeah. slide, um, I, I, I don't know if people are in text, but um, it is five after six. We're going to go a little bit over. And we're going to have a little bit of time for audience questions. And if you go ahead and send them through chat, as soon as we're done with the last two slides, I'll go ahead and, and put them out to the to our artist here. So okay. tell us I'll, about this one. I'll, I'll be succinct. Uh, I was an abstract painter in uh, my early years. Uh, I fell in love with the work of Edward Hopper because uh, he had just a quality of light that I thought just such a wonderful had an energy to it so um, I switched to being a realist just under the spell of Edward Hopper uh, years later by great good very good fortune I became friendly with the people that own Edward Hopper's uh, studio painting studio on Cape Cod and this is a painting that was done uh, from a study 
uh, done in Edward Hopper's painting room of his studio. Out the door to the right is Cape Cod Bay, and the yellow room in the background is Hopper's bedroom. On the bed, uh, I had a cat in graduate school who used to keep me company when I was just getting started with painting, and he was black, and his name was Herb. That was his first word. And that, so I put my, my first cat, my first studio companion, on Edward Hopper's bed, because I just felt that would be bring good luck. Just want to talk about the space really quick. One of the big things you can do with color is describe how different spaces feel. A close space has a different feel than a, a distant space. And segregating the colors like this, you know, putting most of the warm color away from the viewer and most of the cooler color closer. It's, it's a way to make people feel a distance and have a different sense of what it feels like to be in that bedroom versus in the painting room or versus way out there on Cape Cod Bay. So. Yeah, it's really lovely, but it's nice how you you um, tie it together, you know, with this light yeah. just on this little um, door yeah. frame, you know. And that's, yeah, well, you know, that's one of the things that wasn't there, but it had to be added just because the whole right side of the painting felt like it was painted by my brother uh, who's not nearly as talented as me. So I, I needed to tie it in with the left side where my old cat lives. So, you know, you, you, you have to lie about the little things to get a big truth to come across. Uh, yep. And that, that's, I think people understand that about writing, uh, poetry, music, uh, and painting. Yeah, I love your your setup here, Philip. It's in terms of that you sort of the space of the room versus the space of the door and the hallway, and then the space of of Cape Cod Bay. You know, you've got these three distinct spaces, yet they all hold hold together because that the the Cape Cod Bay. I mean, that's that's just you know that's a deep sort of deep space. You know, you're going way back and like you were saying earlier, the yellow of the room, it's coming forward to you in terms of color. Um, and, uh, but it's this vignette, it's, it's really masterfully done. It's, oh, plus, and, then, and then the window, I kind of, you know, I'm expecting the window above the cat to be the space, like the bay in the back, but you didn't, you, it's different. It's, it's the, you're staying within the palette of in the warmth of the room, and it really, it really does it quite, quite astounding. I like it. Oh, thank you. You know that was just one of the eccentricities too of being actually there and, and painting from real life. I mean, there's a sand dune out the bedroom window in real life, just where you would expect what you were saying more ocean. Yeah. So. It's, it's one of the great things about observational art is that you, you know, the world has a head start on us. You know, it's been around for billions of years. None of us are that old. Of course, it's going to be rich and surprising in a way that we haven't mastered yet. And one of our jobs is to go out and notice stuff. Yeah. So what are the meaningful surprises? And then if you can find some of them, is there a way to share them with people? Um, who could benefit from them, from them. And I think that's what all of us painters are trying so hard to do. Before we go to the last uh, slide, Philip, somebody's asking if this is also a cat, but it looks to me like it's a bottle. No, that, that is a, a lamp base oh. that is conveniently there to make the water stay in place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we, we needed that lamp base just to shove the water back. So. Oh yeah, well it works very nicely. I I love the way you the painterly quality of all the different spaces, you know, this um I'm not sure what it is, a rounded wall and and the the little ceiling here. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, all the little different elements and the table, it's really beautifully done. Um oh, thank you. And it's complex the whole scene is complex to pull it all together. So, you know, I agree with, with Phil. Um, we do have questions coming in, but we have the final slide. And as soon as we're finished with this last slide, I'll just start 
going through the questions for the three of you. And this one's called The Light in this beautiful blue painting. So mm -hmm. tell us about it, Philip. Is this white sand too? Yeah, this is white sand. Um, it, this is really a painting about the two different color blues that I love, that I use um, in my studio. One of them is the warm blue, ultramarine blue, and the other is um, phthalo blue, which is a slightly greenish blue. And I, I don't know, I could feel a little, like a little kid, like how could blue have such a different feeling, but two different blues have such different personalities and putting them together like in the sky, there's a greener and a, a warmer blue. There's, uh, it's like a conversation between two people and it, just, they reveal each other uh, differences by sitting next to each other. The landmass is just sand dunes with irregular um, patches of plant growth on them. Uh, that's sort of like clouds. You can play, you know, one of the things that's marvelous about painting sand dunes is you can do any darn shapes you want in terms of the, the uh, plant life and just make some marvelous abstract painting things happen for you. Uh, in the middle of a hillside. Uh, if the plants and the abstract patterns weren't there, this would be such an empty painting. And I think it would just, it would lack surprise. This is also early morning, like uh, Phil was talking about liking to paint at that time. Um, the early morning is just magical. And I think probably all three of us have gotten up early to get out there and have that experience. It's just us and the fishermen at 6 a.m. <laughs> they know something, those fishermen. So. <laughs> so. Do either of you have any anything to add, Phil, Rick? I was just, I was just curious, of, do you, um, Philip, do you use other blues too, or just the you know, Atreum but, and Thalo? Great question. That same teacher that I referenced in grad school, he had a 43 pigment palette. Oh and I was in grad school, I wanted to be just like him because I wanted approval. Did, didn't you want approval too? And I turned <laughs> around 43 colors in this paint box that I couldn't lift and I go outside with it. And well, I got old. <laughs> I couldn't lift 43 colors. And so I just, that's not why I really want, I just thought I didn't need them. I wasn't really using um, some of the other blue pigments and that I, I find I really enjoy mixing color. In fact, I love to get lost in mixing colors. Uh, you know, the big majority of the time when I'm painting, I'm not looking at the painting. I'm studying the colors on my palette. I, I think that's very common for color oriented painters. Uh, you, know, you find echoes of yourself in the colors that are developing and some of the accidental chords of pink against red, say, that you'll have on your palette. Uh, it, it's, it's a great place for discovery. And I, I found just by mixing eight, the basic eight pigments I use, uh, I can get anything I want. And any more than that makes it too complicated. Uh, yeah, you know, life is too complicated. I think it's one of the great complaints we all have. We feel uh, confused, and anything I can do to simplify this very confusing process of thinking I can create an emotionally meaningful depiction of the earth, uh, that, that's a tall order. Uh, we, we need to find some way to make it simpler. And so for me, using eight pigments instead of the 43 pigments my, my crazy instructor used, and he used them well, uh, th this works better for me, so, and it's a lot easier to carry. Yeah, yeah, I I do the same. I mean, I've I think your your limited palettes, as it can sometimes be called, is I think it really. I think one of the the great things about looking at your work is that you, you could see that you're really stretching the boundaries of you're really pushing the limits of the colors that you're using like you're saying you're you're mixing them and you're you're achieving what you want through this sort of limited set of of paint you know of colors and the other thing i really enjoy about this is the those pops of white sand that sense of light 
that's hitting the, the sand dunes as well as the, the foreground bits that are there really gives it a sense of, of depth. Yeah. Yeah. I really wish that we lived in a universe that where there were white trees. It, it would be <laughs> a heaven for landscape painters. You know, maybe in the next life. Who, who yeah. knows? You know, when we were getting ready for this talk, I, I did a little Googling online and, and it turns out that blue is the rarest color in nature. Even though we see huge expanses like this of blue sky and blue ocean, but um and a lot of the blue, I guess you can Google it and read more about it, is is due to the light, not actually the pigment in, you know, and I'm talking about fauna and in flora and all that kind of stuff. That's really rare. So I don't I don't know, because people seem to be intensely attracted to the color blue. Well, it's part of it is it's a it's a very calming color. You know, you know, I think bottom line, colors is emotional and psychological. Uh, it, it, certainly, we could talk about the technical side of color, and, that, and that's an important tool. But I mean, we find ourselves and aspects of our inner self in color, and blue is certainly part of what we are, or at least what we yearn for. Um, you know, calm, centered content <laughs> then there's all those other things <laughs> well that's a whole nother uh zoom talk is to talk about <laughs> emotional um i actually went to a seminar once in dallas on on um color in that aspect of you know how people respond to it, it was fascinating but um i want to thank the three of you i think this talk has just been amazing to hear all of your comments about each other's work and about color and and um, I want to open it up to some questions. We have a few questions already. And the first one is from Heidi. And um, this is to all three of you. So feel free to comment. Do you, do you use colored grounds in your work? And if so, do you gravitate to a particular hue direction? I'll start. I don't. Uh, I, I paint on top of white. Uh, and the reason that is, is whenever I use a colored ground, um, my paintings get too middle toned. And I, I, that's a struggle for me to, to, to have a bright white and to have dark darks. Uh, I, I know other painters really do great with colored grounds. I'd be curious to hear what the other two artists say. Yeah, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, it depends on the, on the palette that I'm using um, in that particular piece like sometimes I've used like a uh, a very thin wash of uh, transparent earth red which is kind of a sepia color uh, but very very thin wash and then wipe it off the canvas so it's mm -hmm. it ends up reading a little bit orangey when you put down say sp particularly if you put down a blue or something it, it ends up reading orange but and that's if I have a lot of blue in the painting that I'm painting I don't do that because it, it's a lot more work to try to cover up that colored ground <laughs> <laughs> than than it is with white Rick yeah and I um usually I don't use it but this uh, this fall I started um putting a experimenting with um neutral or gray different different values of gray as a ground to see what happens. And then then sometimes, you know, very rarely, but sometimes if I wanna like shock myself out of something, I'll I'll, I'll put, I don't know, some color on like a, a yellow or an orange just to get me out of some kind of habit or something. Mm -hmm. But mo most often it's not, it's without a, without a ground. <laughs> um, I can tell you a funny story about how a ground developed but uh, if any of you know the artist Tom Curry, who was also a very colorful plein air artist, he has a show coming up later in August. Um, he hikes into locations with his easel and all his paints. And, and he was, when a long time ago, when he started painting, he hiked to this place. And it was quite a while, quite difficult to get to the place. Um, 
But when he fed up the diesel and everything, he realized he only brought red. <laughs> red paint. And but that that one mistake um, started a whole series throughout his career yeah. of the ground undercoating of red. And wow. it was it purely started accidentally. So yeah. anyway. Um, the next question we have is. From Corin, how much do your palettes change with the subject matter? And I'm assuming this is to all of you. So, you know, how much do your palettes change with the subject matter? Hmm. I, I just say a lot. Yeah. yeah, me too. Yeah, I would say a lot too, but um, like often I'll still have the the same like I don't know how many colors I have now but the, the same amount and the same colors out of the tube on my palette but how I'm choosing and how I'm mixing um is different you yep know? yep same here yeah I, I I think it's something that's very important is the willingness to waste paint you know, I, I always lay out all the colors, uh, just like Rick's talking about it. I sort of feel like the art gods would be angry if I, I didn't. <laughs> well, maybe there are such things. <laughs> definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm laughing, but I'm agreeing. <laughs> um. The next question is for Phil Fry. Why do you use linen canvas? Uh, part of it is um, the texture of the linen versus, you know, linen canvas versus cotton canvas. Linen has a much longer weave and a more irregular weave to it. And, um, to me, and it's also easier for me to stretch and, um, and also to gesso, you know, put to prime it and so forth. It's it the the resulting texture of it I, I like much better than cotton. Cotton canvas has a more kind of regular me mechanical texture, if you will, um, to it. And oftentimes it can be um, too rough of a texture for what I want. Uh, that question was from Jerry, and he also asked, "What are the quality?" qualitative differences between morning and evening light and and that's to everyone I would imagine I, th I think evening's just yellower the, the morning light is tends to be a cooler intense light do you guys think so I don't know if I've ever thought of it about that way before I have to I have to pay more attention to to see but yeah, I, just, I would I would say that too. That, that I think it feels like morning is often feels cooler, but I don't like I've painted both in like right as the sun's coming up and right when the sun's going going down. And my paintings, you cannot tell. Yeah. It will yeah. you know, I can't even tell like is that a was that a morning or a night yeah. uh, evening painting? But yeah. um I think there's a pressure difference the sort of thing when you're painting yeah. in the morning you know you've got the rest of the day behind you know to keep painting but right. at night when i've done sunset you know sort of like a sunset painting it's like you feel under the gun to like oh my gosh it's changing so fast that you know i have you have to make these decisions on the fly that yeah. um, which is one of the great joys of painting outside i think is that I make decisions painting outside that I just don't make when I'm painting indoors. Yeah. Mm. I think, I mean, it's a great question. It's, yeah. yeah. So there's one more question here from Stephen. I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment. Saturated blue has least value, but is perceived as rich. Can any of you guys elaborate on that comment? I wonder if he means that it has a, a dark value, um, but it's perceived as, I don't know. I mean, there's one thing that I, I was um, 
on the gambling oil web uh, gambling website they're makers of uh, oil paints and they have a, a section on their website called color space and it's a really educational section but and they talk about sort of mixing like they did it with ultramarine blue where you know obviously ultramarine blue is very very dark on the on the gray scale but they started to mix white with it and they charted its intensity um, as they were mixing more and more white to it to when it was just almost you know white from you know pure out of the tube ultramarine to to white on this end and then mixtures and they charted the intensity and it it started as as a fairly low intensity and as it started to add more white to it it peaked at its intensity at, at a certain point where they were adding white to it and then of course it dropped back down as it went to the white and to me that was very is very interesting because I didn't sort of think of blue in that way. You sort of think of colors coming out of the tube as being purely, you know, intense, you know, in their most intense form. But it was a very, very helpful thing to sort of see visually. It's like, oh, wow, okay, there it is. You have to, you actually have to add some white to actually start to see it. Um, hmm. 